But as I said, that's not giving either of yourselves enough credit. And if your marriage is going to crumble over you being authentic about your real challenges, that's a problem. Hey, everybody. Before we start the show, I want to make a couple disclaimers. This show does cover a wide variety of topics related to mental health and life in general, and some of those could be sensitive for you. I want to simultaneously encourage you to be brave in consuming difficult content, but also respect and recognize your limitations. So please use your best judgment. I will never be offended if you need to skip a question or an episode entirely, but feel free to feel it out, check out the episode, and just see what happens. If you need to skip, that's okay, but you know, feel free to give it a shot first. I also need to say that while I am a psychologist, I'm not your psychologist, and I'm not your therapist. This is not intended to be direct medical advice, and you should not use this as a substitute for professional help. So with those said, let's go ahead and get into the show. All right. Hello, friends of all varieties. This is the Hardcore Self-Help Podcast, episode 310. I'm your host, Dr. Robert Duff, aka Duff the Psych. I make mental health content for real people, just like you. And today I have a question and answer episode. Um, Two really interesting questions, very different questions between the two of them, um, but I'm excited to get to them. If you want to send me a question to the show, please do so by shooting me an email to duffthepsych at gmail.com or going to DuffThePsych.com, my website, and using the contact form there. Either one works. And of course, if you want to uh, see if I've answered a question related to yours before, just use the search bar on the website. Very, very helpful. Um, it's Before I get into the, the episode proper, it's been such a weird day for me, guys. Like, I'm fine. I'm not super stressed or nothing terrible has happened. It's just been very weird and disorienting. I'm not sure if you ever have those days where it's almost like eerie. You're like, something is weird in the air. And I don't mean it like the anxiety way. I don't know. Like I last night had a bunch of vivid dreams. Um, As I've said, I I, I said this before, but I I do tend to have vivid dreams these days, very detailed and a lot of times very boring. But um, last night I had (laughs) me and my dreams, the things that I remember, I know there were lots of different parts to it. Um, One of the things I remember is that I made out with Jessica Darrow, who is the voice actress who plays Louisa in Encanto, uh, which I'm totally cool with. She's gorgeous. Great singer. So Good job, Robert. <laughs> and then I saw a coworker uh, that I work with in my group practice, who I ended up actually seeing today randomly. Um, and I also had a dream that I like deleted a bunch of important files, like from my clinical practice. And so I'm like, oh god, that was weird. My head was kind of like fuzzy when I woke up from just so many dreams. And I go to work, uh, meaning to the office to do some neuropsych testing, and you know, patients not showing up. So I go, I check the messages. Turns out they called early in the morning. They were positive for COVID, so they couldn't come in. I'm like, okay, well, I guess I got to adjust. That's fine. It is what it is. Um, so I start working on reports instead, and I go into the current report that I'm working on. And I'm like, where are all my files? what the hell? Like I have one file for the report, but all the records and other background that I needed that was there the day before was gone. And like, what the fuck? Like, did I, did I sleepwalk and delete a bunch of files or something? That is bad news bears if I did that. <laughs> and so it took me some investigation and like scratching my head and feeling very odd. But it turns out that the, uh, uh, my partner in the group practice, he was moving files into like digital uh, backup storage and moved those files. And so I got them back, but I was like, what, this is so weird. And like, I don't really believe in like prophetic dreams or, you know, any of that sort of stuff, but I'm wondering if maybe there was something that was like subconscious, like, a, like under the radar, maybe I caught a notification from Dropbox or something that said like files deleted you know, maybe late at 1130 or something when I wasn't really with it, not really working and about to head to bed. And it just sort of subconsciously influenced my dreams. But I don't know, it was like very strange. Um, And so I've kind of been like giving today the side eye, sort of like waiting for the other shoe to drop. Like what is going on around here today? So if you feel similarly, um, (laughs) you're not alone. And hopefully tomorrow is a nice, normal, predictable, unstrange day. But anyway, that's my story. Uh, Let's go ahead and get into the questions. Here is the first one. All right. So first question uh, reads, hello, quick question for the podcast. Are we getting close to effective testing for brain chemistry so we can use the right medication the first time? Thanks, doctor. Uh, So yeah, quick question, but a really good one. 
I appreciate it. And I don't think that I have covered this topic on the show before, to the best of my knowledge. Um, There's been a lot of increased interest in this sort of thing over the past few years. So I think it's a really good topic. And um, interestingly, I did a little poll. Let me me check it. I did a little poll on my Instagram and asked about um, how many people kind of thought that uh, genetic testing in particular is useful for helping to determine antidepressant use. And out of Um, let's see, 74 people that answered 80, 69%, nice, 69% uh, voted yes. So, um, definitely an interesting topic, um, because it'd be great, right? Like it's really annoying when you're trying to get the right antidepressant or, you know, other medications for psychiatric conditions. And it's just so much trial and error and the trial and error is not fun, right? A lot of uh, medications such as SSRIs take a long time to sort of build up to an effective dose up to a month or so. And, you know, you might be getting side effects that you don't enjoy during that time. And, you know, you're waiting for them to level out. Maybe they do, maybe they don't, but it's, you know, putting your body through a lot to go through that sort of trial and error. And then of course, sometimes you need to add on adjunct medications or switch things up and, you know, um, if you get it right the first time, um, you know, I've, I've talked before on the podcast, I'm on a very low dose of Lexapro and for me it's perfect. And I got it right the first time. And, um, I'm very, very lucky for that, but for so many people, that's not the case. And it would be great if there was just like a biomarker or something that you could look at. That's like, Hey, that's the one for you. Um, and with the rise of sites like uh, 23 and me, there's, there's unprecedented access and easy access to your genetic information, which I think is cool. It can yield a lot of important insights, Um, but I appreciate the opportunity to answer this question because there's also a lot of misinformation out there. Um, There's a lot of marketing. There's a lot of uh, over-extrapolation of information that happens, and I think it's really, really important to be a critical consumer of healthcare things, especially in the United States where we have you know, drug companies and other various kind of healthcare or healthcare-adjacent companies that are allowed to market you know, um, very aggressively to the public. And it's not exactly always the, you know, expert doctors that are sort of guiding treatment, (laughs) which is just kind of mind boggling when you really think about it. Um, But, you know, when you say testing for brain chemistry, uh, I think that genetic testing is really about as close as we have right now. There are also things like functional neuroimaging, meaning not like a static image um, just of the brain like you would see in, say, an MRI, but like um, a, a, a... actual sort of live representation of, of what areas of the brain are, um, you know, stimulated or where metabolism's happening. Uh, basically, um, an active picture of how the brain is working in that moment. And there are some, you know, promising avenues there. Um, but really, currently, there is nothing out there that is known to reliably help us choose appropriate medications for psychiatric disorders. So the answer is, are we getting close? Um, that's, that's relative. You know, it's hard to say closer than we were before, but we are not there. And I'll explain, you know, more about all of this. I'm going to use this mainly as a prompt to talk about genetic testing, because that's what uh, most people I see in practice and most people I see online are curious about. And it's also been more and more common for doctors to recommend it or you know, use it as part of their decision-making process. I see people come into my office and actually bring in their printouts, you know, uh, about their genetic testing and, you know, talking about which antidepressants this has led them to and such and such. So it's, it's being actively used and, you know, there are a lot of companies out there that have this available. So when it comes down to it, really what most genetic testing for psychiatric medications actually tell us is how well our bodies metabolize something basically the rate at which your body will use up a substance. And in some cases, you know, there could possibly be some utility for this. Like for some medications, a slower metabolism of the substance leads to more of it hanging around in your system. And that for certain things will in turn cause more unwanted side effects like headaches or nausea or things of that sort. In other cases, you know, metabolizing something very quickly may mean that somebody needs an actually higher dose than usual of a substance because it's just burned up so quickly. And that's actually something that we see in kids um, in the realm of psychiatry. Uh, A lot of times parents are very taken aback by how much medication their child is on. So if a, if a kid has say an anxiety disorder or, you know, a psychotic disorder or something like that, and they may be placed on a, a fairly high dose, 
it's not because they need more of the medication in their system at a time for it to work. It's because they metabolize so quickly. Their young body burns through it so quickly that they actually need a higher dose or more frequent doses to actually make an impact on them. Hey friends, the Hardcore Self-Help Podcast will be right back after this short message from our sponsor. All right, this episode is brought to you by our sponsor, BetterHelp. You know, we are great at taking care of many things. You know, a lot of us uh, do a great job taking care of our car with regular maintenance. You know, we care for our homes. You know, some of us even do a great job caring for our body with exercise and diet and things like that. But for some reason, we don't really treat our brains the same way. Um, And how we care for our minds affects how we experience life and how well we're able to move about the world. So it's really important to invest some time and care into keeping your mind healthy. There are a lot of ways to do that. You know, from taking naps when you need to, to stimulating your brain by learning new things, by having great conversations with people that you trust. And there's also therapy. Um, Therapy is a great resource, not only for people that are actively struggling with some sort of mental health difficulty, but for people that are going through a transition or just want to learn more about themselves so they don't get to that point where they are having some sort of crisis. So you might want to check out BetterHelp Online Therapy as a resource for this. BetterHelp is online therapy that offers video, phone, and even live chat-only therapy sessions. You don't have to see anyone on a camera if you don't want to, but that is an option, and it tends to be way more affordable than in-person therapy. You can be matched with a therapist in under 48 hours, which is extremely quick, especially these days when it's kind of hard to find a therapist. So you guys, the hardcore self-help listeners, get 10% off your first month at betterhelp.com slash duff. That's betterhelp.com slash duff for 10% off your first month of therapy with better help. All right, guys, back to the show. So similarly, you know, if you learn through genetic testing that you metabolize a certain thing, or you're likely to metabolize a certain thing, right? They're different. <laughs> um, if you're likely met- met- to metabolize something very quickly, then that could be an indicator that you might want to look at your starting dose. But these are very loose guidelines. And what it comes down to is that clinical judgment and other health factors are way better predictors of how a medication is going to work than genetic testing. Um, because you know, even blood levels of a drug, how much of it is actually in you doesn't always predict a clinical response, right? It, it's not a one-to-one thing. It's not like, oh, you have more of this, so you're gonna have more of an effect. So these tests effectively tell us nothing about how well a given drug will work. Um, at best, I think that they can be used sometimes to, to loosely guide and maybe point out which drugs you may want to avoid at first, just because, you know, um, maybe you under metabolize or over metabolize them. Again, uh, you have a likelihood to, right? You're looking at the genes here. You're not looking at in practice. So you have a gene that says you're more likely to metabolize this a certain way. So even that is a little bit loose, right? Um, it's known that certain genes determine uh, a bit of our risk for depression and other psychiatric conditions, as well as how well they you know, respond to treatment. But there's no single gr- group of genes that's been determined in the general population to tell these things. So we are really in the infancy of learning about this stuff. And unfortunately, some of the genes that these companies the genetic testing companies have singled out as markers for drug efficacy of how well the drug works in individuals. This is not supported by the clinical research. Um, so there's a lot of research to be done. As I said, the, the field is in its infancy, all things considered, but there have been a lot of studies already, right? There have been a lot of studies and they generally do not show any benefit beyond just good psychiatric practice to find the right medication. Um, In some studies, what they find is that people go into the study and their medication is not effective, and it's because they're on the wrong medication for them. And so eventually they get on the right medication and, you know, voila, they're doing better. But in these studies, it's not even the genetic testing that helped them get on the right medication. So they got better, but not because of the genetic testing. It's just because they had somebody practicing better psychiatry, asking the right questions and things like that. So it's, it's a serious thing. You know, the APA, so the American Psychiatric Association and the FDA have actually taken action on this. They've um, both put out statements advising that genetic testing at this point should not be used by medical professionals in determining which antidepressants to use after they've established task forces and looked at the research and things of that sort. There just simply is not sufficient evidence to support their use in clinical settings. And this isn't uncommon, you know, in the early stages of things, there are a lot of different, you know, diagnostic 
um, tools, you know, say a, a PET scan um, of the brain. You know, there are different types of PET scans that can be done, and some people will very much over extrapolate what those are used for, and they will say, oh, this is diagnostic of something like Alzheimer's disease. When in reality, it's not. It's um, one piece of data that is, you know, correlated, but not even in and of itself uh, a, a great source of information. So, you know, this is a common thing that happens. Um, and there are issues related to the claims that companies make. You know, unfortunately, we're in a society where misinformation and inflated claims spread really easily. Something sounds exciting and it sounds snazzy and new. People are going to jump on that. Um, also, one has to do is spend enough on Facebook advertising or to get the right TikTok influencer to convince people that something is the right clinical choice for them. You know, I can imagine a TikTok video that's, you know, one of the stupid voiceover ones that's like, oh, today I learned that you can actually use uh, take home genetic testing to find out which antidepressant works for you. Oh my God. And then everyone in the comments will be like, are you serious? I need that. Blah, 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 blah. Right. So it's very, very easy to spread information like that. Um, and that advertising that, that those companies use lead to profit. And so you have these for-profit companies that are very motivated to appear as if they're a useful clinical tool. It kind of reminds me of other fields like um, in supplements, right? So what I'm thinking of is Prevagen. There's a supplement called Prevagen, and it's maybe you've heard of it. They advertise it on TV. Um, this is mainly for people in the U.S., obviously, but they advertise it on TV around the time that they play Jeopardy and Wheel of Fortune, which are game shows. And the demographic for those shows is older. You know, there's a high, um, you know, 60 and above contingent that watches those shows. And so they're targeting that audience. And, you know, they say, oh, you know, it's made from jellyfish and it can help your cognition and blah, blah, blah. It doesn't. It just straight up doesn't. It doesn't help with your, it doesn't change anything for you. Uh, I'm, I'm not sure if it has caffeine or you know, um, one of the caffeine derivatives that, you know, can boost cognition for a very short amount of time, but it doesn't actually help. But millions of people buy it because of how the advertising is done. So similarly, you know, you get these ads for genetic testing and somebody who's desperate to have a better solution is going to jump on that. And um, the FDA has actually had to warn some of these genetic testing companies about making false claims about the efficacy of their product for uh, psychiatric disorders. Um, one strategy that you need to be aware of to be sort of a critical consumer of uh, this information is that a lot of companies on their website will provide a section about research, you know, so let me, let me test it. Out. I'm just going to, I'm going to go, I'm going to look for, hold on, genetic testing for uh, antidepressants. I'm going to type that in real quick. Okay, so let's go for the first one. There's an ad on Google at the top, Gene Sight, Psychotropic Test, Informs Depression Treatment. So I'm going to the first page of that. Ooh, depressions in older adults. Resources. Patient. Let's see if they have FAQs, genetic insights. Specialty topics, news and press releases. So yeah, they have information that's put out there as if it is, you know, um, clinical information. And a lot of times it's not. Um, and a lot of times they put a section where you're like, okay, here's the here's the data. Here are the data that show that this is effective. But the way that they're interpreting the studies are completely wrong. They could be looking at the same study that the FDA is looking at, and they say this proves that this works. And the FDA is saying, no, <laughs> you know, the people in your study got better, but it's not because of your product. So, you know, just because they have a link or a section that provides research, it doesn't mean that that research actually supports their product. So it can be very confusing. Um, a lot of times you're not, you know, actually looking at the primary studies. And so um, I would suggest you, you know, if you are science literate and you are able to interpret them to look at the primary studies that they have on their websites, or bring it to your doctor, you know, follow accurate science reporting organizations that might talk about the topic, but you need to be careful of it. In between the ease of access, the customer friendly packaging and reporting, the aggressive marketing, it's just very much an easy recipe for people to buy into science that isn't necessarily harmful or bad by nature, but it just simply isn't there yet. And it's a little predatory. If you do decide to do genetic testing, there's nothing wrong with that. Um, just take it with a grain of salt and bring things like results from it and any ideas that you have into your doctor. This isn't just true for 
psychiatric medications, but also things like 23andMe, where you're looking at, you know, your vulnerability to perhaps like get a degenerative disease like Alzheimer's or MS or cancer, things of this sort, you know, it's one piece of information among others, and it should be the clinician's job to put those together. And it's just one factor in making these decisions. So, I mean, this is exciting stuff to be clear. It's awesome that we have, you know, easy access to genetic testing at home. It's awesome that they're constantly developing new imaging and in functional imaging techniques. And, you know, in, in a number of years, we might have a combination of tests that look at, you know, your genetics, the neuroimaging, blood markers, and other biomarkers to determine what is that best fit medication. Uh, maybe there's AI involved in this. I'm not sure, but we're not there yet. It's very exciting, but don't overinterpret the fad just because it's out there and it sounds cool and it would be very, very nice to have. So that's my advice to you regarding that. All right, so on to question two. Uh, question two reads, I hope you're doing fine. To introduce myself a little bit, I've been fighting anxiety and depression for almost a year. I took two types of SSRI medication. One was citalopram, which didn't work for me. The other was fluoxetine, which was only helpful for my anger and the feeling of being constantly on edge. For anxiety, I took buspirone and propanolol. Although I know it's very wrong, I stopped taking my medication for some reason that made me worse than ever, and I'm on medication for hypothyroidism as well. I recently married my partner of seven years and told him about my anxiety and depression after nine months of struggling and overthinking. He took it well and was supportive. So now the problem is that I don't feel anything related to sex appealing. I hate it even when I think about it. I wasn't like that, and I know it's due to depression and anxiety, but I can't tell my husband about that. I think he's under enough pressure himself, and he knows about my depression too. I'm the type of person who hates to be a burden on loved ones, even though I've told him about my depression, I do not talk about how awful I feel most days, and try to hide my constant crying with him, because I believe it makes him sad and depressed, and I hate that. So I can't see it in myself to tell him that I don't want to have sex with him, or even kissing is a hateful thing for me. We do not live with each other yet because we're moving to Canada, therefore I try to ignore him by making myself busy. And whenever we have sex, I hate all of it, and I don't even feel anything. I know that it's the only pleasure I can give him right now, and I think it would jeopardize my marriage if I told him how I feel about sex. It shouldn't always be about me and my feelings, you know? So what should I do? I'm really helpless here and could really use a good bit of advice. Okay. Um, well, first off, thank you. Thank you for the question. I appreciate you you know, trusting me with this. It's a sensitive thing, and I'm, I'm really sorry for what you're going through. Sounds like the past year or two has been super hard for you. You've experienced a lot of ups and downs, and it's been probably pretty confusing. So first, I want to empathize with that. You know, you've been through a lot. Now, I want to warn you up front. This question, my answer here, is going to involve a bit of tough love. And there's some things I think you do need to hear here. Hear, hear. I think there's some things you need to hear. <laughs> you've got some serious work to do in the communication department. Um, I've worked with a lot of people that have been in situations like this. I've seen what this looks like down the line. When I encounter them, this is years and years down the line where this has been unaddressed and it's been, you know, kicked down the line like, okay, we'll work on it. You know, we'll work on it at some point. We'll work on it. Or just hidden, swept under the rug, you know, just not addressed. And then when I get to them, they're navigating a separation or a divorce or things are just really bad. I don't want you to get into that situation. You know, you have this opportunity here to not let that happen. So yeah, I understand that you're trying to care for him, but in doing so, you're actually hurting him, yourself, and your relationship altogether. You would not be a burden by sharing what's actually happening for you, right? That's just your experience, good, bad, or otherwise. You, this would just be you being honest. And I think that you need to give him some credit here that he cares about you enough to handle it. One of the things that you need to realize is that your behavior is already being shaped by the feelings that you described. These things that, you know, you feel towards sex and, you know, your depression in general. Your, you know, behavior is already being shaped. You're avoiding things. You're treating him differently. You're acting differently. And without knowing why you're acting this way, your husband is only left with his own guesses and interpretations right? He doesn't know why you're acting this way. So he gets to let his mind go crazy. He may interpret your lack of interest as avoidance of him, um, that he's unworthy, that he's gross, that you don't like him as a person. Any way his mind bends it is fair game because he has no other information to go off of. 
Um, you know, he knows that you're depressed because you said so, but you're also hiding the details of your depression. So he may not think it's all that bad. He may not think that it could possibly be coming from that. The answer is not hiding things from him. You're not going to protect each other in this partnership by being inauthentic. And that's not a foundation for a healthy marriage, right? You need to think about that. Like if, if you're seriously, um, you know, hateful of the thought of kissing him, that's a serious situation. And for you to hide that and pretend like everything's okay, um, that's not setting you guys up for success, right? That's not fair to either of you. You're trying to ignore him by keeping yourself busy, and neither of you deserve that. Like, I understand that it comes from a place of care. You're trying to take care of him by doing this, but you're not. You're avoiding the problem instead of addressing it, and that's going to cause it to fester and grow over time, and it's only going to be harder to deal with down the line. Um, it's also important for you as a person that you don't just force yourself to have sex when you don't like it because that can build a negative association, right? You have this negative feeling towards sex because you're forcing yourself. There, there's a difference between not feeling like it and just doing it to kind of get the ball rolling. And then once you're having sex, you enjoy it and it's fine. There's a big difference between that and having sex, even though you hate every moment of it, right? That should not be happening. When it happens like that, you can build a negative association to sex, which, you know, can really mess things up down the line for you, for him, for, you know, anybody that's involved. And you could also potentially have some trauma related to sex that happens because of it. And we don't want you to have to deal with that. You had mentioned that you think it would jeopardize your marriage if you were to talk about these things openly. But as I said, that's not giving either of yourselves enough credit. And if your marriage is going to crumble over you being authentic about your real challenges, that's a problem, right? Why would you want to preserve the marriage and make sure that it succeeds no matter what when it has to be sort of built up on these twigs and thin branches where it could fall at any moment? That's not a good thing, right? You want to build a strong foundation this early on in the relationship so you can continue to build from there not propped up on stilts so that any breeze can blow it over. So if you feel like this would really destroy your relationship, that needs to tell you something about your relationship. You guys need to work on this together. Uh, you said it shouldn't always be about you and your feelings, but you have to understand that from his perspective, you haven't been sharing your feelings, right? It's just an internal experience. He may feel like it's all about him because you're not sharing what your behaviors actually mean. You're just privately struggling with them on your own and they're running the show. They're dictating your behavior. They're making you act in different ways. So I implore you to be honest with him. It's difficult, but it's necessary. And, you know, I think that there are things to work on here if you want this to improve. There are options. It's important to consider, though, um, if this is a new issue. You kind of hinted that it is. You said it hasn't always been this way. But, you know, really think about it. Is this a new issue or is this one that's existed sort of under the radar for a long time? You mentioned that you feel like this is due to your depression and anxiety. That's totally valid and completely possible. You know, depression is a great way to sap somebody's libido. Um, anxiety can do the same because you just feel off. You feel scared. You feel, you know, intimidated. You just don't feel like you're comfortable doing that sort of thing. So that's possible. But, um, you know, if you didn't get relief from your symptoms before when you were on medications, maybe you weren't on the right ones, and then you stopping them made it even worse, so there's a lot that can be done here. There's a lot of low-hanging fruit to get back into trying to get a handle on your psychiatric symptoms. Um, but I don't want to be pushing you into something that you don't want if you're actually just not interested. If you are asexual, meaning you just don't have the same sort of interest in sex that other people might have, or there is something fundamental that is you know, not compatible with having that kind of sex, only you know those answers. So I don't want to push you toward those if that's you know inappropriate. But if that is what you'd like, if you would want to get better at this, if you would like to get back to a previous you know level of interest, etc., um, there are things that you can do. And regardless of the sexual issues with your spouse, um, your depression is not under control right now, and you need more help managing it. Whether that's psychiatry, you know, getting medications again, therapy, both, you know, support groups, all of the above. You deserve to have more control over your life instead of letting these symptoms just run the show for you. I think that if you were to take some action here, like work on your own depression, maybe engage in sex therapy together, um, use any other resources that are available to you, this would be a good signal to him. Rather than him being resentful and feeling like you're a burden, 
it would be a meaningful sign that you're willing to work on things that he is worth working on things for, right? Um, Because in the opposite way, like if you're not willing to work on them and it seems like you don't care to, what does that say about him? This is from his perspective, right? So these are things you need to think about. It's, It's not going to be a bad thing if you're trying to make progress. Now, I'm not trying to say that's going to be easy, not by any means, but it is necessary. There's no perfect way for you to sort of broach this subject with him, but I would encourage you to be honest, be as honest as possible. Um, You know, for example, you could sit him down and you could say something to the effect of like, hey, I have really been trying to figure out how to tell you this. Uh, It's really difficult for me to talk about. It's hard to bring up because I'm ashamed of it. I don't want to hurt you, but I also don't want this to just fly under the radar forever and, you know, be unfair to you. Right. So just open it up in a way that's very honest and vulnerable and tell him you don't understand why this is happening, but you find sex to be something that is just not enjoyable and even aversive to you. You don't like thinking about it. You don't have a desire for it. And intimacy in general has really, really changed for you. Um, If it's true, let him know that it's not just him. You know, if it's something that you can't stand the idea of regardless, then, you know, that's something you want to let him know about. And if you feel like it's secondary to your depression, be honest about that right? You want to talk about the fact that you have been hiding some of the depression from him and he doesn't know how bad it is. Just be honest. Now, you know, if you aren't attracted to him and never have been, uh, you don't need to rub that in, but I wouldn't lie about that either. I wouldn't be like, oh no, you're perfectly fine. You know, I'm super attracted to you. I do want to want you, etc. If that's not true, right? Just don't lie about it. But if, if, you know, it is true and something has changed because of what you're experiencing, be honest about that, right? Let him know that you're worried about ruining things, but you need to come clean because you need help and you don't want him to think it's just because you're not attracted to him or something. And if there's anything on your side, you know, for yourself personally, that you need to stop hiding from yourself, that you need to be brutally honest with yourself about, please do that right? So for example, if you feel like it wasn't a good idea to get married, if you've never felt sexual feelings toward him, um, if there's things like that, you need to bring that stuff out into the light, even if it's just privately and start facing it. For your sake, these things need to be worked on. Um, If they've always been this way, then maybe you need to work toward accepting that and adjusting your life accordingly. But I don't know how old you are. You seem to be young and this is very, very early in your marriage. So there's a lot of room for growth here, potentially. There's a lot of opportunity here. Talk to your doctor, talk to a therapist, see a sex therapist, see a psychiatrist, get on better medication, talk with your spouse about it, talk with your trusted people in your life about it. You're not alone and there are many, many options here. The only thing I'd advise you to not do is keep avoiding the issue. Do not avoid the issue, approach it because avoiding it is going to make future you in a very bad spot. So I believe in you, you can do this. And with that, everybody, that's the end of the episode. This has been episode 310 of the Hardcore Self-Help Podcast. If you'd like the show notes, go to duffthesec.com slash episode 310. If you want to send me a question, send it to duffthesec at gmail.com. Please take very good care of yourself. Stay safe out there. And I'll see you for the next episode. Bye.